Hi, this is your host Sapil Bharatiya. Today we have with us once again David Aviler, Director of Open Source Supply Chain Security at the Linux Foundation. David, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you so very much. It's really great to have you back on the show because the kind of you know bird view, if I can use the word, you have when it comes to security, that's incredible. So I want to hear from you if you look at you know modern world, <laughs> uh, you can also compare it with the legacy or you can say traditional IT world. How have you seen security evolved from those days to today's multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, cloud-centric cloud native world? Uh, a wide variety of changes have taken place. Uh, some good, some, well, not so good. Um, I think one of the big positive changes is that more and more uh, developers are taking security seriously. And that, in, in my mind, is probably the most positive viewpoint because much of the information about how to develop secure software, um, it exists, but the first step is for someone to say, oh, I need to look for that and learn from that. I think that's by far and away the most important step. And um, there's more and more information that's uh, more easily available. I I'm sure we'll talk about more, but for example, the OpenSSF, we have a free course, on how uh, online course on how to develop secure software. Um, and so to the you know, people are interested, the information is becoming more easily accessible. Um, there are more tools. Um, I think tools are a big help. They're not, you know, tools will miss things, you know, Tools sometimes have false positives in general, uh, so the tools are not the end of the story, but they are a helpful part of the toolbox. Uh, probably the big negative is the uh, increasing monetization of uh, security attacks. Uh, it's not like that hasn't happened before, but more and more attackers have found that either because they're part of criminal um, ecosystems or because they work for, for or with governments which desire attacks, um, has basically meant that the attacks have become much harsher, more serious. Um, and so that's a probably a negative side of the story. But I think overall, I mean, the good news is that, yes, um, you know, the attackers are upping their game. But the good news is that a lot of the defenders have realized that there is a game and they have to play. What is the ground reality that you're seeing? Because we're also seeing a lot of attacks. You know, every week we see something new attack. And these are not mom and pop shops. But these are well-established tech companies who are getting compromised. So between something is wrong there. Uh, and security is not an easy thing. It's complicated. So I would understand that what is the ground reality that you're seeing that just Developers are putting effort, companies want it, but there are some big gaps as well. Like many such things, the uh, the the reality on the ground is complicated. <laughs> okay, let me, let me maybe that's the best way to start. Um, I agree with you that um, you know if, if the only goal is hey developers. De Deliver some security. I don't even know what that means because security is an emergent attribute. It's not, you know, you deliver functionality and it has to have these qualities, including reliability, including uh, security. Um, so that that said, um, I actually don't agree that it's always harder. That's, you know, indeed, many of the mechanisms for countering attacks are doing things in ways that uh, once you know how to do them, make many things easier. Um, you know, for example, SQL injection is a very, very well-known attack. It's it's one of the top attacks against web applications. Um, and yet the mechanisms for countering that, you know, if, if the solution is, hey, never make a mistake, boy, that's, that's kind of a rough, I, I don't know how to solve that one. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are certain interfaces like prepared statements and similar te techniques, which if they're used, they immediately counter that kind of attack full stop. They're also, once you learn how to use them in general, easier to use, easier to understand, often faster in performance. And, and so you know, for many, many of these things, it's simply knowing don't do X, do Y, it performs the same task and oh by the way it's far more secure now there are areas where it's much harder um you know if you're writing in c uh it's very very challenging to write software that doesn't ha have undefined behavior things like in particular memory uh safety problems things like uh buffer overflows um you know that is a challenge um Frankly, the simplest solution in many, many cases is maybe that's not the language you should write new programs in.
because 70% of the vulnerabilities you're going to have in those kinds of applications on average, I mean, there's, there's, are going to be memory safety problems because your language doesn't protect you. Maybe you should look at alternatives. Now, some places that doesn't make sense. And if you've got existing software, you may not have billions of dollars of effort available to just <laughs> instantaneously switch. And often there are reasons that people use those. But um, in many, many cases, there are alternatives where you can make a decision to eliminate entire classes of problems and make them far, far less likely to uh, succeed. What kind of new patterns you are seeing uh, there, which you are like, hey, these are the concerns, these are the things that we should address? Well, I have to admit, uh, there's a whole lot of the everything old is new again. Uh, you know, people want to talk about, oh, it's new. It's new. Like, it, you know, the first time we saw this was the 1970s. Wait, this isn't very new. Uh, a, whole of these, a lot of these, quote, new attacks are just, you know, uh, they're relabelings of old pra practices that we've seen many, many times before. Um, certainly people are, are taking steps to try to insert malicious code into open source software, for example. Um, it's not that that's new per se. There's just more efforts doing this. But I mean, the good news is in part, people are trying to do that because increasingly some of the other methods are becoming less effective. Um, and indeed, although everybody's all very, very worried about, you know, in malicious insertion into the open source that's widely used, uh, right now that's by far the minority kinds of attacks. By far and away, the most common kinds of attacks are when people are downloading the wrong software. It doesn't matter how good a developer uh, does in their development if you don't, don't, don't download their software, but someone else's software. Uh, so and this involves things like typo squatting, dependency confusion, where attackers basically trick people into downloading the wrong things. Um, and for that, frankly, um, although there are efforts to try to counter these in the various repos, and I think we're going to see more of that, uh, the number one most effective technique, frankly, is a little village vigilance. Before you say, I'm going to add this new software as a dependency to my system, double check. Is that what you actually wanted? And make sure you're getting it from the right repository. Many, many systems, by the way, uh, have mechanisms to say it must be from this repo, it must not be from that one. And you know, double check that name. If you're using this, I've used this program before, it's really widely used, and you do a double check and hey, it just appeared last week, that's not the one you want. <laughs> okay. And and so really just a little bit of double checking. Uh frankly, a whole lot like uh when we're countering social engineering attacks. Hey, when somebody calls me up and says I won the lottery because they're a prince or they send me uh you know, send me some emails, I'm probably gonna double check that before I just assume whatever I'm being told on the phone or an email is true. And I think the same you know, not that you have to be paranoid, but the, just kind of the, the due diligence. The, the, let's do a double check of that. It eliminates a vast number of these problems right from the get-go. Security, as much as, as you were earlier talking about, is about tools, but it's also about processes and people. What kind of cultural changes you are seeing in organizations today that not only encourages, you know, a kind of organization-wide, because security is everybody's problem, kind of organization-wide approach to security, but also kind of build a culture where it's like either it's developer or operator's team that security first is their strategy or policy. Uh, well, s several different things. I mean, I mean pe people are, you know, some people say, oh, DevSecOps, oh, that's new. No, this is old stuff. It's a new name for an old practice that you should have already been doing, but you weren't. So um, at the very, very least, I think the increasing, you mentioned process, the increasing embedding of many, many tools to analyze the software, the dependencies, and so on um, at every change. And, as, and doing things like uh, automatic reporting of, wait a minute, the dependency you've got is old. It's got a known security vulnerability. You, here's the push this button to update that component. Um, I think it's very, very much um, in line with, with all that. And I think um, what's, the, you, know, you mentioned changes over time. Um, one thing that's changed uh, over time is the decreasing costs of CPUs, where, you know, unless you're using an incredible amount of CPU, but CPU bandwidth is essentially free. 
Um, and so, you know, all the historical efforts of, wow, we want to minimize the number of tests because it costs, so, you know, you know, it takes so long to run a test. That doesn't make any sense. Or, oh my goodness, you know, we're going to run a security tool, but we'll only run it every once in a great while because, um, you know, it, you know, we, we may have to take an incredible long time to run. You know, um, you can run a lot of these tools, you know, either every commit or most once a day. And as a result, uh, again, you have to be careful here. Tools don't solve all problems, but tools are absolutely a critical part of that. And there's no reason why not to run the, run, you know, traditional tests, many other kinds of verification techniques like SAS tools, DAS tools, and so on, because they can help detect problems before they get out the door. Um, and, you know, the whole notion of, you know, having ops completely isolated and never talking to the development never made sense. Um, and so having that feedback of here's what we're seeing out in the real world, here are the problems, here are the attacks, let's update our systems so that, you know, during development, they're developed for use in real operations uh, based on the lessons learned from real operations is a critical part of it. Um, and you could have said that years ago, but it is easier now uh, because of the various things I've just talked about to make that a reality. Do you also see that when we do talk about cultural change, uh, a lot of organizations still have the same mindset of, hey, security is someone else's problem. Uh, security is, you know, uh, an afterthought. Uh, or do you think that those cultural changes are already in place? It's just, you know, uh, that security is, you know, it's always a cat and mouse game. So that will always be there. Uh, let me separate that into separate questions here so, so I can answer them one at a time. Uh, first of all, as far as organizations go, I, mean, I think the reality is that organizations are all over. You'll see organizations that are essentially doing the same thing they've been doing for decades with general failures and, you know, they'll repeat the failures uh, again. Um I think a lot of organizations have at least made uh, lip service and some really have drawn uh, closer towards that. Um, if not a full devs, uh, DevSecOps, at least trying to make sure that the ops and devs are not so disconnected. Um, so on the one hand, I think that there is progress towards uh, more connection. Uh, on the other hand, we have, a, we have the pressure of scale. Um, historically, you would, you know, people, you know, if, if you follow the amount of code in systems today, um, you know, the best estimates basically go off the charts. Now, there's um, now in many ways, of course, this is great for the end users because they're getting far more capable functionality than they had before. Uh, now, how are we doing that? Well, one of the main ways we're doing that now is by dividing up the work. Um, and in particular, using a vast amount of open source software components. Um, you know, uh, the latest numbers I have is anywhere from 78 to 90 percent on average of all the code in a system is actually open source software components. That's for the and that includes the proprietary systems. You know, when you open them up, it's almost all open source components. That's a good thing. That's enabled things to scale. Um, the the side effect, however, though, is that we're far more dependent on far more software, um, and that can be more of a challenge to uh, secure. And because it's much more efficient for different organizations to specialize on this component versus that component. Once again, they may not be aware of how it's being used in operations because in fact, they are, they're in charge of building this narrow component, which is brought in by a bigger component, which is brought, you know, brought a bigger component. And suddenly you have many, many, many tiers. And so um, this has been helpful in terms of it enables the scale and capability of systems that we see today. The challenge is reporting back to these to the developers of those individual components. Hey, wait a minute, you're used in situations you may not be aware of. Here's some feedback. Um, the solution to me, my mind, by the way, is increasing feedback from the developer and operations back to the, those that they're bringing in as supply. Uh, I do see a little bit of, the, of that. I think we need more of that uh, because I don't think we're going to go to, you know, one organization builds all the software. That's just not a sensible approach. Uh, and so you need to have different organizations interacting. Um, and that's why, by the way, uh, the Open Source Security Foundation, which I support, I'm support, i supporting with, you know, we're very much focused on helping 
various open source software projects, which know that they are important, but not necessarily knowing exactly where they're being used, helping them up their game, get information, look for vulnerabilities, fix them ahead of time so that they're not, um, so that there are far fewer problems out in operations. What advice do you have for organizations to improve their security posture? And once again, I'll throw two questions at you uh, bundled together. One would be just to improve their security posture, which actually we touched upon a lot in this discussion today. But second, as the open source adoption is growing, as you're talking about earlier also, so that they also become open source citizen. Not necessarily, not everybody has resources to contribute back to open source, but at least they can do a bit minimum so that they can help uh, uh, you know, improve the code that they're also using in their products and services. Sure, I, I love those questions. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying to answer them. So, uh, first of all, how do I, you know, how do I develop more secure software? Uh, there's no grand mystery. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest problem I view is that most software developers have never been told how to develop secure software. I don't know why we should expect anything different. What I tell people is we get more secure software than we deserve. Uh, because of that, this problem. So, how do we fix that? Uh, step one. Education. If you're if you're developing software, go take a course on how to develop secure software. Uh, we have the OpenSSF. We've got a free course. Takes you about two days uh, online to go through, um, and uh, it'll tell you a whole lot about the basics about how how to do that. Tooling. Um, get tools into your pipeline. Get them to look for vulnerabilities. Get tests. Uh, you know, so that you know when, uh, you know, to make sure that the software is doing what it's supposed to do. You know, automated tests, automated tests. If you're depending on manual testing to tell you anything about your software, you're already in trouble. You're already getting left behind. That, that's this not, not. And more generally, if you know, you're going to depend on software, use package managers, which are an, the way of automatically managing your dependencies. Um, when you bring in new dependencies, double check. Before you bring in something, there's probably options. Check and see. There's uh, OpenSSF has a guide on how to evaluate uh, software before you bring it in. Um, take a quick check because that can turn out to avoid some problems like typo squatting, as well as just encourage you to move towards the software that's more likely to be fit for purpose, more secure. Um, okay, and so th there's there's a whole lot to unpack there, but at least I think that gets it gets you going a little bit there. I, and you know what? Um, I I think f to be this may seem strange, but self interest can be a really helpful guiding principle here. Um, if you were building, uh, let me let me give an analogy because maybe this will help. If you are building a car and you just buy random engines and random other parts and hope for the best from your suppliers, you're probably not going to produce a good product. Even if you don't build all the parts, you are probably going to try to figure out what are the most important components and the suppliers of those, and I'm going to go back and work with them because it is in my interest to make sure that the components I'm bringing in are really going to work in my system. And that doesn't mean they have to do everything exactly just for yours, your, your purpose, but more than likely they can make changes that will be better, not just for you, but for everyone else. And this gets us actually back to the question you asked earlier about how do we feed back operational information to organizations outside yourself? And the answer is really communication. But, I, but I'm including communication in a very broad way. That can include anything like, hey, I'm using in this way, um, here's a bug I see, um, here's the bug all the way to, I'm going to sit down and collaborate and work with you because what you have is is mostly great, but I need some additional capabilities or I need to have a security review to make sure that's fit for my purpose. Uh, the OpenSSF has already funded a number of, for example, security evaluations where we go out and look at the software and look for vulnerabilities and get them fixed. Um, and organizations can do the same for the components that they most depend on. And if you say, man, I bet there's lots of other organizations who do that, great. There, you know, that sounds like a good opportunity for collaboration. And actually, that's what the OpenSSF is for, is to enable organizations to work together to figure out, hey, wait a minute, these are the same kinds of problems we're seeing over and over again. Instead of funding something once, why don't we pool our resources, be it people or dollars or euros or anything else, and um, pull it together 
to uh, make things better, not just for themselves and not just for their customers, but also for the world more generally. I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.